Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back here at Ancestral Health. Um, I was addressed this morning as Dr. Phil, and I'm the original. I was Dr. Phil before McGraw was in grad school. Uh, I'm the one with the hair. He's the one with the money. Um, well, as members of, of this uh, society know, um, Stone Natures did not have a miserable disease-ridden existence. I mean, if they did, we wouldn't be here. And as Boyd Eaton and Marjorie Shostak and Melvin Connor have pointed out generations ago, a generation ago, they were taller and stronger and healthier than most of us are today. So what were the kids like? It's really an interesting story. There are a few surprises in there. This is a, a condensed version of a two-hour presentation. So if you'd like more information, uh, I have a, a list of references, about 35 or so. And if you contact me through my website, I'd be happy to, uh, to mail it to you. So what was the frame of reference? Well, we're looking at about uh, 50,000 to 100,000 years ago. And the fact is that the human genome hasn't changed very much in those 50,000 years. There are, there are some changes. One is some of us have become resistant to malaria, for instance, um, because of changes in red cell uh, uh, physiology. Uh, some of us are tolerant to gluten, some are not. Uh, many of us are lactose intolerant, especially in those areas where, where dairy production is, uh, has never been very common. So what did a Stone Age family look like? And that's what most people think of when they think of Stone Agers. But this is what they really look like. And what's the one thing you notice about this family group? Nobody's overweight. And nobody's obese. I mean, if you were obese back in the Stone Age, you'd be some animal's lunch. So it's important to know that child health begins before conception. Because a pregnant uh, stone nature was healthier than a modern pregnant woman, which, which seems at first blush to seem kind of odd. But when we look at modern women, we find that 90% of women these days of childbearing age are deficient in at least one major nutrient. And the examples are these calcium and iron and folic acid, for instance. And that is, has spanned generations. Uh, studies continue to show that that is true. When we look at the pregnant stone nature, we find that she was in excellent physical health. I mean, she had to be to survive to childbearing age. She had a normal percentage of body fat. She didn't use tobacco or alcohol or drugs. And she had no trans sexually transmitted diseases because in those small groups, uh, sexually transmitted diseases simply didn't spread. Epidemics uh, certainly couldn't spread. And she was immune to most local infections because of growing up where she was exposed to germs and she was essentially getting vaccinated by the germs that she took in her, in her environment. Well, when it comes to a healthy pregnancy, she had fewer maternal complications because she was healthy and therefore fewer infant complications. For one thing, she didn't have gestational diabetes, which ranges from different population groups from maybe 4% to about 10%. And in fact, it's increasing by about 50% every 10 years or so. Uh, there were no elective C-sections, obviously. And th she had fewer children with congenital defects because she had a healthy pregnancy. If we look at some of the modern hazards that we, we see among our, our childbearing uh, population, we find that overweight and obesity are linked to an increased rate of uh, birth defects involving the heart, the eye, the GI tract, the kidneys, et cetera. And when we look at women who are overweight or obese, they have an increased risk of having a child with cerebral palsy. Simply being overweight increases the risk by, risk by about 22%. Having severe obesity doubles the risk. And these are things that simply did not happen back in the Stone Age. There was no tobacco back then. And what we know now is that smoking during pregnancy is linked to tumors of the eye and the brain and to leukemia that mothers who smoke have infants who will have thinner retinas, and therefore they have a greater risk of, of glaucoma uh, later in life. Also, mothers who smoke are less likely to breastfeed, and we all know what the advantages of breastfeeding are. There was probably no marijuana back then. We can't be sure of that. <laughs> but we do know that marijuana use during pregnancy is associated with increased risk of childhood leukemia and brain tumors, 
and a particular kind of tumor called a rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a tumor of muscle. And both regular smokers and marijuana smokers have kids who have a lower birth weight and more likely to be premature. When it comes to strength of the skeletal system, uh, we find that a mother who has low bone mass is going to have children who are, are themselves bone deficient. And one of the major reasons is because of a lack of physical act activity. And as a matter of fact, in, if we look at adolescents these days, only about 20% of adolescent females get as much as an hour a day of moderately intense exercise. It's important to note that calcium is only one of the many bone building nutrients. Calcium is important, but there are many other things that are as well. We also find that mothers who smoke will deliver kids who have a, a weaker skeleton. And we know that from studies of eight-year-olds. Eight-year-olds are kind of the markers of bone fragility in children. We find that among eight-year-olds, uh, eight uh, the risk of forearm fracture today compared to 1970 is about double. And so we're clearly having babies whose skeletons are not as strong. What does that tell us about what osteoporosis is going to be like when these kids reach middle age? One of the challenges that we find now is that about 6 to 7% of modern women have had some sort of, of uh, eating di uh, disorder, bulimia, anorexia, nervosa, et cetera. And that occurs during the particular uh, age span when they are building a strong skeleton. And therefore, they are not taking the nutrients that they need to do that. Looking at the very first moments of life, we find that there's a difference, a big difference between natural birth and C-section. For one thing, the birth canal obviously is very narrow, and the baby gets really squeezed coming through. So the chest gets squeezed, the lungs get squeezed, fluid in the lungs gets squeezed out, which is the reason why babies born by uh, natural childbirth are less likely to have uh, breathing problems uh, afterwards compared to C-section babies. Well, the birth canal is a pretty messy place. And so they end up uh, swallowing a lot of the probiotics that will be so important to them later on. Uh, generally speaking, the cord was either cut or bitten through, and this really it still grosses me out as a, as a physician. Uh, but they had no instruments, obviously, back then. There's something called the vernix caseosa, the Latin word for cheesy varnish. And when a baby is born in most places today, Things are changing, but in the past, generally, uh, the baby was taken away and washed off and then given back to the mother. Well, now they give the baby back to the mother because they know that in those first moments, that contact is very important. And so the baby ends up with that cheesy varnish. Now, this vernix has a lubricating factor and an antibacterial factor, and this is what it looks like. Only a mother could love something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Breastfeeding back then obviously was the only choice because there were no substitutes for breast milk back in those days. And we didn't begin domesticating animals until about 10, 12,000 years ago. It's pretty hard to milk a mammoth. And so that just didn't get done. And it's interesting now we are, are so certain that there is a very close relationship between the breastfeeding mother and her baby. We call that the mother-infant dyad because the milk changes every day. The milk that the mother produces in the first week is different from what she produces in the second week and the second month and the second year. And it varies with the gender of the infant because the milk that a mother produces for boy babies is different than the, mother, the milk she produces for girl babies. And the obvious question is what if it's a boy and girl twin? We still are not sure, except that there is some research to show that uh, same-sex twins, when they mature, are taller than opposite-sex twins, and it may be something to do be because of the breast milk that's, that's formed for them. Well, one thing that is nice to know is that breastfed babies usually, not always, but usually sleep better through the night. One of the reasons is that there is a variation between day and night milk and that there is some melatonin present, more melatonin present in nighttime milk than there is during the day, and so the baby obviously is going to sleep better. Another really fascinating factor is that the milk changes whether or not the baby is born prematurely or full term. As an example, omega-3 fats are transmitted through the placenta during the, the, the last six or eight weeks of the pregnancy. So what happens to the poor kid who's delivered early? 
Well, it turns out that if the baby is born prematurely, the mother's milk changes. And she then begins to produce more omega-3s in her milk to make up for what the baby didn't get in his or her last six or eight weeks of uh, fetal life. The breast, of course, is a wonderful defense mechanism because there is an enormous variety of, of immune factors in breast milk. And we now know, uh, talking about probiotics, that those favorable bacteria are present in breast milk even before labor begins. We used to think that breast milk was sterile. Now we know that it is not. What does that tell you about the priority that nature gives to the importance of probiotics in our environment? Well, there are live cells in breast milk. There are no live cells in formula. And if there are, the guys in quality control are going to be out of a job because formula not only is always the same, but there can't be any live cells. But breast milk contains at least five different kinds of live cells. And if, there, if the baby takes cow's milk with live cells in it, say fresh cow's milk, that those cells will be digested. But the cells that come from the mother's breast are not digested. They pass through the intestinal tract, and they migrate to the immune tissues of that baby, where they can persist for years. We know that they persist for at least seven years. And it's a possibility that some of those cells persist for a lifetime to add to the immune capability of the baby. It's certainly true from many studies that breast milk affects the brain and the eye development, not to a huge amount, uh, but there are measurable differences. No one has ever shown that, that kids who are breastfed only have a lower IQ or whose vision is less good than those um, who are, are fed uh, formula. There are some other breastfeeding benefits. <clears throat> One of the major ones is that they have fewer infections. This is really important in the, in the third world of developing countries because, as you know, formula makers have been promoting infant formula in developing countries for decades. And the problem is, if that formula has to be reconstituted with water because it's either a powder form or a concentrated form, the sources of water in those countries are not safe. <clears throat> so that increases the risk of gastrointestinal diseases among children. Until early in the 20th century, gastroenteritis was a major, the leading cause of death among children. It still is in developing countries, and that's one reason. As I mentioned, breastfed babies tend to have a consistently but slightly higher IQ. We used to say that breastfed babies were less likely to be obese when they became older. That is not as true now as it used to be because there are so many other factors during childhood that contribute to childhood obesity. So the breastfeeding factor tends to be diminished somewhat. One of the important things about a baby who's born prematurely is that they are at risk of something called necrotizing enterocolitis. And the younger, the smaller the baby, the more likely. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a condition where a section of the intestine simply dies. And we now know that by feeding the, that baby's mother's breast milk, it lowers the risk of necrotizing entero, uh, enterocolitis, possibly by as much as 40%. It is now standard practice in many hospitals in the NICU to give babies <coughs> their own mother's breast milk. <clears throat> There's some maternal benefits of breastfeeding. And one of those is that immediately after birth, if the baby is put to the breast, the uterus begins to contract as a reaction to that suckling. And therefore, it, it contracts the blood vessels, lowering the risk of bleeding. Well, in a developing country or back in the Stone Age, that was a big deal because a major cause of death among mothers is postpartum hemorrhage. They also have a faster return to pre-pregnancy weight. When a mother produces breast milk for her baby every day, she's, she's putting out about 500 calories. Well, 500 calories a day for a week <coughs> is 3,500 calories. That, that amounts to a pound of fat. So mothers who breastfeed return to their pre-pregnancy weight faster than those who form the feed. And we now know that there is a lower risk of later breast and ovarian cancer in mothers who breastfeed. Now, this is a complicated issue. Part of the fact it may, <clears throat> may be because they tend to have less adipose tissue. And as you know, adipose tissue produces estrogen. Estrogen is a driver of some, some cancers, and that may be one factor. There may be other factors involved, too, that we're not yet sure of. But one thing that we are aware of is that the immature breast is more susceptible to cancer-causing agents. 
If a mother has not gone through pregnancy and lactation, some of the cells in her breast never completely mature. And that lack of maturity means that those cells are more susceptible to carcinogens, especially those that are present in tobacco smoke. Mothers who breastfeed worry about getting something called mastitis. Mastitis occurs when the breast either becomes very uh, engorged or becomes actually infected. There are two kinds of mastitis. And when the swelling occurs, some of those ducts begin to rupture, break down, send cellular tissue into the mother's bloodstream. And there seems to be some sort of immunologic phenomenon that lowers the risk of ovarian cancer. There is a lower risk of later cardiovascular and liver disease in, in mothers who breastfeed, again, because they are less likely to be obese and less likely to have those drivers of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. And this really, really cute little kid has been riding around on the mother's back like that since the first day or so after he or she was born. And that's the way hunter-gatherers carry their babies, and probably they did back in the Stone Age, so the baby was always around the mother, which meant if the baby was carried in the front and was hungry, he or she would simply reach up and grab the breast that's right there. And for that reason, the breastfeeding is done on a very frequent basis. When we looked at the first baby foods, we find that, generally speaking, weaning occurs in hunter-gatherer societies between two and four years or so. And there is something called pre-mastication, where the mother chews the food, puts it back into the spoon, and feeds it to the baby. I was 10 years old when my brother was born, and this really grossed me out when I saw my mother doing this. Still kind of grosses me out, except nature is not stupid. Nature provides that kind of mechanism for feeding babies because there are salivary enzymes that the, baby, that the mother provides in that pre-masticated food that begin the digestive process, makes it easier for the baby to digest that food. It also adds probiotics to the baby's system because the mother, of course, has these normal flora in her mouth as well, and she gives that to the baby. <clears throat> Also, there is something called uh, IgA, immunoglobin A, secretory IgA, uh, which is formed in the upper part of the mouth, the respiratory tract, and this is also protective. So it's one more level of protection that the mother gives to her baby when it comes to combating infection. When it comes to nutrition, <clears throat> there, Stone Age had an enormous variety of, uh, of plant and animal foods. <clears throat> Certainly, they had a hundred or more different kinds of plant foods, hundred or more different kinds of animal foods. And what they found was, of course, everything was organic. And food was always fresh because they had no way of preserving food. Plant foods, of course, are low in sodium, they're high in potassium, and we have reversed those ratios. We now have taken twice as much potassium in our diet as we do, uh, uh, twice as much sodium as we do potassium, and that's not the way we are designed. There was minimal contamination because nowadays you've heard about outbreaks of E. coli in terms of things like sprouts or, or, or ground beef. And that's because of our ways of producing and, and disseminating food. Well, back then that didn't happen because all the food they had was produced locally and there was no transshipment, there was no storage, there was no time for, for organisms to grow and, and reproduce in that food. Well, there are some diseases that kids did not have. They didn't have what we call the usual childhood diseases, things like measles, mumps, chickenpox. And one of the reasons was there was no epidemic diseases. I mean, they, they lived in groups of 25, 50, maybe 100 people, and that made it impossible for epidemics to occur. Also, at the uh, time of the agricultural revolution, we began to develop diseases that came from animals. First, how many of you have ever traveled to Switzerland? Have you ever noticed some of those houses, a family lives on the second floor, the animals live on the first floor? Do you wonder whether some germs are spread back and forth? Absolutely, and that ha that's been happening since the start of the agricultural revolution. Back then, there was no such thing as type 2 diabetes because overweight drives type 2 diabetes and they didn't become overweight and certainly never became obese. I was in pediatric practice for 35 years. And it's been 25 years since I've left practice. But during those 35 years, I never once saw a child with type 2 diabetes. 
If you go to any metropolitan pediatric diabetic clinic these days, you'll find nearly half of those kids have type 2 diabetes, which simply did not exist a couple of generations ago. They, of course, had no obesity-related problems because they were not obese, and now we're seeing obese kids in the first couple of years of life. That in New York City, for instance, 22 or 23 percent of first graders are obese, not just overweight, but obese. They didn't have rickets, and they wandered around all day with no clothes on in the sunshine. And Stone Age, of course, didn't live in the far north. They lived in a few hundred miles north or south of the equator where they had sunshine all the time. They got plenty of vitamin D, <clears throat> and therefore no rickets. Excuse me for just a moment. My Marco Rubio moment. <laughs> so there was no one who was vitamin D deficient. And they didn't have acne. Hunter-gatherers don't have acne when they go through adolescence. And Lauren Cordain was someone who published one of the seminal papers on this issue and indicated that there's something about the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that keeps that from happening. Well, there were no epidemics in the Stone Age. However, they did have parasites uh, in or out of their body. Uh, part of my career was spent in Puerto Rico, and I was visiting with the head of the parasitology at the hospital in San Juan. And I said, what, this, no, this, this was, of course, over 60 years ago. And I said, what percentage of people who live in Puerto Rico have parasites? And she says, doctor. If we do a stool examination and we don't find parasites, we think we've made a mistake. So we do it again. Well, obviously, things have changed in the last 60 years in even places like Puerto Rico, but they were part of the normal flora, the beneficial organisms back in the Stone Age. What happened was that we co-evolved with parasites. We need them, and they need us. And parasitic worms and bacteria, as you know, are becoming part of mainstream medical treatment. We, we joke about poop transplants, but that's happening both for bacteria and parasites. When it comes to elimination, there were no diapers in the Stone Age. And so how did mothers handle that? Well, you saw how that baby was carried in the sling. Hunter-gatherer mothers learn to sense when the baby needs to void, and they hold the child away from them, pointing away, of course. And therefore, the baby eliminates uh, right there. Now, when I was a pediatrician, I got to be pretty good at telling when a little boy with the diaper off was about to unload. Not always, but most of the time, I could guess when I was going to be a target. Uh, well, so toilet training began in the few, very uh, few uh, months of age. When it comes to crying babies, you may have heard that Apache babies don't cry. And I have verified this by reading information from Native Americans, and they point out that among the Apaches, raiding of other tribes was common. So the mothers and the kids would go, and they'd try to escape to an arroyo or a canyon, <clears throat> pardon me, or hide someplace. And if the baby cried, it was a giveaway that the raiding party would find them. So from the very first days of life, mothers began to pinch the baby's nose shut when they began to cry. Because babies are obligate nose breathers, because if they're suckling, they can't breathe through their mouth. They can only breathe through their nose. That doesn't change for several months. And very quickly, those babies learn that if I whimper, mom's going to do this. And the fact is that they didn't cry, and some hunter-gatherer babies never cry, maybe for different reasons. But one is that they're carried by the mom all the time. They're always close to the mother's body. No reason to cry, because the breast is always there. Attention is always there. There's no reason to cry. And the fact is that babies are meant to be carried until they can walk and keep up. I know that's pretty hard to do these days. Uh, we had six kids. My wife never carried anyone around in the sling. She had other things to do with the other five kids, obviously. But the fact is, among hunter-gatherer populations, that's exactly what they do. If we look at the way primates behave, we find that, we, uh, that, that gorillas and, and monkeys and other primates carry the babies on their backs for weeks at a time. And among hunter-gatherer societies, crying babies reflect badly on the parents in those societies. So there's some social pressure to keep babies from crying. 
I wonder if there are any moms in the audience who had a kid who was a picky eater. Yeah. Well, picky eaters live longer. I mean, think about this. You have an 18-month-old who wanders away from mom, and he or she begins to eat any kind of, of uh, berries or whatever they can find. And if they're the wrong kind of berries, they don't grow up to reproduce. And so that uh, trait is hardwired in us. And some kids will only accept a new food when it's been offered 20 times. Very few parents are going to give kids peas more than two or three times if the kid says no. But if they just persisted, they would do that. They would eat it because they saw mom and dad eating it and siblings eating it. And that pre-mastication tends to minimize that problem. The fact is that breastfed babies accept foods more easily. But there's some behaviors that never change. Kids forever are falling. And I'm sure that back in the story, some kids say, hey, guys, watch this, as he tumbled off a tree branch or fell off a rock. They fought with each other. They certainly were subject to things like snake bites. When I was in practice, every, every spring, I see a kid almost always a 10-year-old boy who was sure he was faster than that rattlesnake. Well, he wasn't, so it was always bites on the arms and hands. There were animal bites. And then, of course, it's something like this. Now, he's obviously not a stone-ager, but one of the things that you may be aware of is that toads and frogs have toxins in their skin. Some of them are really dangerous, but some are hallucinogenic. And it may be that that behavior happened back then as well. There was, of course, a daily egg hunt. Kids were the best egg finders. And, and you have to ask you, how many kinds of eggs did they have back in the Stone Age? Turtles, snakes, alligators. Did they all taste the same? No. And, you, of course, you know who this is. That's Pigpen. The Pigpen theory is known as a hygiene hypothesis. And we are host, as you have heard this, this uh, week, uh, to about 1,000 different species of bacteria. And they boost our immune system. They form barriers against harmful bacteria. They lower cholesterol. And they provide nutrients that are not present in food. And we're exploring yeast and fungi and, and viruses also in terms of uh, beneficial or microorganisms. And the fact is our kids are too clean. Because we know that kids who grow up on farms are less likely to have allergies like eczema and asthma than kids who are city-born and are not raised with kids. Their first vaccines came from dirt and feces because they acquired the germs that would protect them. If a related species were a dangerous one, they were already somewhat protected because they had ingested the more benign form. You all know the three-second rule? Yeah, when food falls on the floor, if you pick it up within three seconds, it's okay to eat. Well, I have the 10-second rule, one, two, three, because I want to get some bacteria that might be on the floor. Well, not really, but you know. But the fact is that clean food is not normal for humans. Back in the Stone Age, they didn't wash their food. They didn't wash their hands. They ate whenever they could. They could. Going barefoot is something, of course, we are becoming, becoming aware of, because for two million years, nobody wore shoes. Does the name Abebe Bekila ring a bell? Yeah, he won the marathon in Rome in 1960, and he was barefoot. So what was the risk in the Stone Age? Well, there was no glass and metal to get involved, to stab your feet. Uh, and barefoot running is coming back. Huh. Yeah, this is known as co-sleeping, because babies and mothers are evolved to sleep together. And this idea of overlying and infant death as a result is something that only began to occur about two or 3,000 years ago, because back then, there were no mattresses, there were no pillows, there were no ba baby <coughs> blankets, baby bumpers. <clears throat> and this is why babies suffocate. In a study from Australia of sudden unexplained infant death, they found that there were no unexplained infant deaths. They all had a reason. I'm going to go through this quickly, but the reasons they found were obesity, drugs and alcohol, bed covers, et cetera. We find toys and games among children's graves. And before the agricultural revolution, we didn't, don't have any evidence of that, but we find fingerprints of, of children on miniature bowls from the ninth century and miniatures found in children's graves. Boys are buried with weapons and girls with kitchen utensils. Why do children fight with their parents? Because they're learning how to do that in a safe um, environment. If a 12-year-old has a terrible argument with his dad, the dad will knock the snot out of him, but he's not going to kill him. 
But if he argues with some other guy's kid's dad, he might end up dead. They learn how to uh, hunt and gather from an early age. Hunter gatherers, boys learn how to track from the age of eight. Stone age children probably follow a similar pattern. When it comes to puberty, girls begin to menstruate at about 18 in hunter gatherer societies, and they may be married by that time. Now, girls married at the age of about 12, menstruate at about the age of 12, and because of that, they may accumulate more body fat because body, um, body fat then produces estrogen, et cetera, and they have what's called ovarian, uh, incessant ovulation and ovarian cancer. The downside is that for millions of years, children were discarded or sacrificed at many points in human history. And the 10th plague of Egypt, in fact, may be this kind of problem. It may be that the reason for the 10th plague, the firstborn child, the firstborn domestic animal dying was not because it all happened at once like in the Cecil B. DeMille movie, but because it was a practice in the pre-pharaonic days of Egypt and kids were sacrificed. Excuse me, sacrificed. When I heard the story about Abraham and Isaac, I wondered how is it Abraham didn't complain to God when he said, you have to kill your child. And it's because in that period of prior to 2000 BC or so, when Abraham lived, child or infant sacrifice was a common practice. And that's why Abraham didn't put up a fuss. You know why Isaac was only 12 years old when Abraham was told to sacrifice him? If he were a teenager, it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. So, oh, my wife hates it when I tell that one. So. We know that the Aztecs sacrificed children for various reasons, and modern hunter-gatherers sometimes do as well. And finally, when it comes to technology, there's the old man with the arrow through his nose, and the kids are saying, Dad just can't get the hang of this new technology. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And I'll be around if you have any questions. We have about eight minutes for questions, if you have any questions right now. These are very useful for people watching the presentation because they'll be recorded. So if maybe uh, someone has a question, they want to pick his brain. Great presentation. Thank you. My question is around breast milk and we understand how important it is for a child. I talk to some female friends of mine that say, I just don't produce enough breast milk to feed my baby day and night. The baby's too hungry, so I have to start mixing in the powder milk. What would your response be? How do we handle that? <clears throat> That's a tough question. One, I, I wrote an article call, called um, Breastfeeding Inadequacy. But I've never submitted it any place because I don't know where to send it because it's such an emotional issue. And the fact is that our culture for generations, uh, certainly during the mid of 20th, 20th century, downplayed or actually abhorred breastfeeding. And so today's grandmothers, many of them never breastfed because it was looked down upon. So they can't pass down that lore to their daughters. And so we have lost that entire body of experience of breastfeeding mothers who could teach their, their children how to breastfeed when they had, had their own. There was a study done on this issue um, that showed that if uh, mothers who had this breastfeeding inadequacy problem were counseled and given some instruction that that so-called inadequacy was resolved about 80% of the time. And even a woman who has very small breasts has plenty of breast milk, uh, breast forming glands to form adequate milk. And I have had babies in my practice who are twins and they, I mean, these were like the Michelin kids and the mother was exclusively breastfeeding for both of them. And the interesting thing about breastfeeding is that when there are twins or three, the breast actually produces more milk in response to that. Again, nature isn't stupid. Nature wouldn't waste the child. And so this breastfeeding inadequacy is relatively uncommon and we have lost those breastfeeding skills. And I think that's a major problem. I'm curious about uh, complications and death during childbirth in hunter-gatherers. Um, modern medicine is lauded for how much it's helped uh, um, reduce that. 
and there, there must be some like bell curve over time where it has improved something that got bad, but it maybe was better in the deep past? Well, uh, we, we really obviously don't know uh, because we don't have any way of, of really identifying what the causes of death were. Mm -hmm. Uh, during childbirth. We know that during the 18th and 19th century, infection was very common. And if you've ever heard the story of Ignaz Semmelweis and the, uh, the strep infection, uh, childbed fever is a tragic story. Um, that was very common. Probably less likely that they died of infection, but that was possible. But certainly if there was what's called cephalopelvic disproportion, the skull was just too big to come through the birth canal, both the mom and the baby died, and we, we see that still in developing uh, countries. Right. My guess is that probably most of the causes of death in mothers in, at that period were either because of, of the cephalopelvic disproportion or from bleeding. And I can't really make a good case for infection because, again, the kinds of germs that devastate populations didn't get transmitted from one group to another because of the distance involved. Do you, so do you that, think that's that my best guess. The uh, encephalopelvic disproportion may have been less for nutritional and, and just lifestyle reasons? Um, I, I don't know. I think it, it's, it may be because uh, the uh, human pelvic anatomy is not quite perfectly developed yet. The, the pelvic structures uh, in some women are such that that canal is so narrow that obstetricians can, can tell by sonograms before delivery, this baby ain't going to come through that way. Um, and when I was in practice, I saw, I was in the military for 20 years, and I saw a lot of women, a Filipino women, who, or Asian women, who were very small, and they had, were married to guys that were pretty good size. I wonder, how is that baby ever going to get through? But most of the time, they did not require a C-section. And so there are all those individual variations, and there's no way to predict that without a sonogram, and they didn't have that back then. So, yeah. thank you. Good question. Yeah. So. Well, thank you all for being here and enjoyed it. Hope to see you again next time. So.